So today we have a relatively short session. This is uh, just three talks. And the first speaker is Katie Will from UCSB, and she's going to tell us about robustness of bipedal locomotion, right? Yeah. So the final stop and the final question. All right. Yeah, and that's optimistic. I have my slide. I have way too many slides in five minutes. So please ask questions afterwards on the details I can't get to. So the formal talk, the meaning of my talk is decoupling quickly selection from uh, robustness to terrain noise. And um, I have two questions. One is why use legs for robots? And I'd say it's to be able to pick footholds. And the second question is, well, why do you want to pick footholds in terrain? And the question would be because you have rough terrain, which implies that it's noisy. Okay, so if we think about the state of the art for robots, there are robots that are good at robustness, there are robots that are good at foothold selection, and we're really trying to meet in the middle but not in an ambitious way, just at the performance level of, say, a two-year-old. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the first part of the talk, an actuated slip model, and the idea is you have an actuator that's in series with a spring. Um, the slip model forces the spring-loaded inverted pendulum. And we're interested in reachability for this actuated slip model. The idea is how much can we change the next apex state after you've already committed to a particular touchdown angle. So passively, there's going to be one particular apex state if we think about the apex state, it has positions x and y, and velocities in x and y. And by definition, the apex state has a zero velocity in y, leaving a three-dimensional um, state space left for the apex state. So once I commit to a touchdown angle, it turns out whatever I do to wiggle that actuator, I'm going to end up pretty much on a 2D surface. Those different slices so, so different slices, each corresponding to some touchdown angle. Um, and it turns out that the it's not quite a TV surface, but it's very close to being so. It's thin. And I can basically, knowing that whatever I do when I wiggle my actuator only puts me in a 2D space, I should be able to come up with a way to parameterize a family of motions using only two knobs to twiddle. So I'll show a bunch of examples. For instance, we could do something. The most efficient thing would be if, we could, if it's possible, just do a step change. And that gives you some reachable space. If you have limitations to the actuator, you might have a um, constant velocity you can go to, that limits the space you can reach in some ways, a sinusoid, a truncated triangle wave, etc. Um, we're, we're implementing these ideas. The idea is to try to get a hopper and actually put it on terrain where we have an idea of what the footholds are up ahead, we can pick footholds, but then there's uncertainty about the terrain and we can respond to that. Right now we're building the hopper on the left. Um, Martin Bill, my husband, has helped us design for that. And then Jason Cortell from Cornell, who you guys saw yesterday in the Ranger video, is building a higher performance hopper that we're just starting to build this summer. Um, this is a little bit more um, details. You can ask me questions about the exact hoppers later. In short, um, the higher performance hopper with the cables is a little riskier, a little bit more expensive, has uh, actuators in series and parallel, and we hope it's going to be higher performance. Um, the actuator limitations, we want to be able to respond quickly, fast. Um, so we're limited by the velocity, which is roughly speaking, the steady state velocity proportional to voltage, peak acceleration, which goes as the current. These are step responses for the hopper that we have in vertical hopping right now. Um, and we can get about 20 centimeters for a half leg hopper. And I'll just show a quick video. This is uh, half carry. Hopefully it's going to play. Well, if it doesn't play, I'll move forward here. So, right now, simple 1D copy is not too exciting, but we're really trying to be able to see how quickly we can move the actuator to be able to change the, the timing and amplitude for motions. Um, and the application for this would be to use something like model predictive control. So there's some work that was done by a master's student in our group, uh, Martin Grishman, looking at model predictive control, where we use a very simple model for the model predictive control um, for a, a limited time horizon, say three steps. And then once we're actu actuating a, a certain step, we use a lossy model, a more accurate dynamic model, and we tune what the actuator is doing to try to stay on that plan for the model predictive control, and it can also stay responsive to terrain noise. And I've got a video, but I'm going to skip over that. So 2D reachability seems like a limitation. The advantage is it gives us only two knobs to mesh over to try to decide what we're going to do at each step, basically. Um, so thinking about 2D meshes, um, I'm going to go very quickly through work that we're doing with a compass gate robot with a torso. So there's three positions, angles of the limbs, meaning there's six states, positions and velocities. And if I take snapshots when the stance leg is vertical, that leaves n minus one or five states left. That would be a lot of states to try to put into a mesh. 
Um, but fortunately, it turns out, when you look at what happens for a given controller, all the states tend to lie on these 2D manifolds inside of a five-dimensional space. And so the different colors show you swing leg angle, torso angle, and torso velocity as a function of the uh, uh, velocities of the, uh, the leg and the, the, uh, the stance leg and the swing leg. Um, just real briefly, I know I'm out of time here. Uh, we can look at the maximum perturbation this walker can do with the given controller. But trying to predict what's going to happen in the long run is a lot more complicated because of the mixing effects. So the probability of falling at any given step is not the probability that I'm going to hit that threshold. Because if I've been walking uphill for a while, I'm more vulnerable. Um, this gives an idea of states that I would visit in Monte Carlo trials, um, meshing again over those 2D states. And then this would be terrain height on the Z axis. And there's a ceiling for a one-step perturbation that causes failures. And there's places where my failure events tend to happen. And they don't happen. Um, at the, the, the worst case scenario from steady state walking, they happen at much lower steps after I've been walking uphill for a while. Um, so this shows where trips, uh, failures happen due to having not enough energy, low energy, close to zero velocity for both states. And this is where um, I trip. Basically, I, my leg just doesn't get up high enough to clear the terrain. Um, so with only about 100 points or so, I can actually mesh the state space just running a Monte Carlo trial, seeing where I ended up and using the states that I observed to build my mesh. It's extended slightly here to, to, to uh, look at some ex extreme cases of terrain. Um, and using that mesh, I can predict where failures are going to happen. I can predict what happens for different types of terrain. Um, this is all promising work to try to make higher degree of freedom systems more tractable. So 2D meshes rock is the, uh, the, the theme of this, uh, this whole talk being able to think about dynamic programming for systems by reducing the dimensionality. So um, our goal is to do something like receiving horizon or model predictive control for a hopper, looking at 2D reachability. Um, here the actuators either got to be quick or you are dead. And uh, meaning you're going to fall down. You're just not going to be able to respond to terrain. And with the 2D torso, um, 2D, um, the compass gate model with the torso, building 2D transition matrices. Um, sorry, I went over time. Um, Thanks. Uh, Brian Satzinger and Pat Terry are here, so hopefully you'll have a chance to talk with them at the, the talk. Martin Richman and Millie Chen are largely responsible for the work I just showed. Um, and we do hope you can visit us sometime in Santa Barbara. Thanks. Questions? Well, that is a good question. So we were talking last night about um, art clothes a statement that in optimization, he made two points. First, he said, we need to use units that all match. It doesn't make sense to, to match uh, apples and oranges. And if we're going to pick a currency, why don't we use energy? It's not that energy is the only thing we care about. But if you're going to be able to compare energy to other things, why don't we use that as a gold standard? Maybe the more energy you have, the longer you live. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is a cost function where we never get positive energy, it's always going down. It's as if we're all just living for a certain amount of time until entropy forces us to die, which is sort of a depressing way to think about it. But maybe if you put other things in units like procreation or, or web hits or whatever your other currency is, you know, there are people using your, your papers and being cited on Google Scholar, you can match other things to energy. I don't know. That's a great idea. But he made a second statement kind of implicitly, which is that the cost you want to optimize comes when you add some scale terms. Um, and I, I would kind of argue against that. And I'm going to spend my whole time on the question of talking about should I do it going? Or do you want to ask a question? Yeah. So it's still useful for us to look at the 
what's the best case, if we got the actuator, what we really want to do with the actuator is to be able to get, um, I'm not sure if I'm addressing your question, but we really want to be able to get the actuator to move instantaneously to add energy. We know that's not going to be the case, but it's interesting to look at how that happens. And it's still useful on the planning for the model of predictive control. So far, it's been useful for us to think about that idea model and then realize that if our actuator has enough flexibility during stance, we know there's going to be error in the terrain anyway that we're going to have to correct for, or somebody's going to push you anyway. So if those errors are on the order of the error that we have due to using the wrong ideal model at the beginning, that seems reasonable. I don't know if that addresses the question. later with this. I have this, uh, I don't know if I should show one movie, but if, if uh, can I go through this in 40 seconds? Okay, so I, I want to spew randomness talking about this idea of adding costs that, that aren't gave. So let's say I give you a game. You have a bankroll. We call that bankroll N um, at any given time. You want N, you are given the opportunity to bet some fraction of that bankroll with a 50-50 coin toss chance of either winning or losing. If you win, you win twice whatever you bet. If you lose, you lose your entire bet. The question is, what's the optimal bet? Um, this is pretty straightforward from the expected value point of view. For instance, let's say I bet I just say half of my bankroll at some given time. After one step, I can kind of look at the, the positive green and negative outcome of what could have happened and fast forward over time. And on a linear log scale, you'll see that the mean is growing, but the median of what happens if I win twice and then lose half again and again, I haven't gotten anywhere. On a long scale, the median thing that's gonna happen is, is that I, I don't make any money. However, it's still true that my expected value after a certain number of, of uh, bets is positive. Um, so the optimal thing to bet is actually to bet everything. That is absolutely true from an ED point of view, but from optimizing the log rate of growth, you actually wanna bet a quarter of the bankroll. And just to show examples of why that is, this is what happens if I bet half my bankroll. On average, I'm really not getting anywhere. If I bet 25%, it's again noisy. But there's, um, you know, these are different Monte Carlo trials after many bets. So after 350 bets, I've made about, about a billion dollars, starting with $1. Betting 60% of my bankroll, the expected value is definitely positive over the long run. But if you look at trials, I'll, it'll be a long time before you find one of them where you're actually positive after 350 bets. Um, and then you can bet something that's less than optimal, which is usually what gamblers do. Betting 10% instead of 25% would be typical because it lowers variance. I can get the same slope by betting 60%, um, no, 40% of the bankroll, but it has higher variance. This is a distraction. Anyway, my, ar my argument is you don't want to necessarily optimize expected value because you care about variance. And there are definitely formal tools that balance this. So for cost functions, I'm not sure exactly how to apply this to robotics, but expected value isn't the whole story. Yes, sir. All right. So let's move on. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>